Alex, um, I was impressed, not necessarily in a positive way, but it just it, it made an impact on me when I found that near-death experiences or out-of-the-body experiences for certain individuals motivated their theory of consciousness. Um, sh should it have that power? Yes, and more. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm a it's, skeptic. Well, it's a big edge of consciousness, what happens when we die. Let's start by the question, what happens to the mind when the brain dies? Now, if you're a materialist, the answer is no big deal. The mind dies, end of the question, right? But what if it doesn't? And many traditions have said that it doesn't, that there's something in us that's immortal or non-material, and we should not be spooked out. Like, okay, now what's changed in the last 50 years now is that two things that doctors could resuscitate patients. This didn't happen before. So they could bring people back to life in the, in the reanimation room. And the second thing that happened together with this technological achievement or technical achievement is that doctors started, started listening to the story. So here we have a good example of first person, third person. Now you can do something objectively and you can also pay attention to what those people say about what they saw when they were mm. clinically dead, which by the way, also makes us reconsider our own definitions, not just of consciousness and of death. And so what do they say? Well, they say many things, but they say, I saw myself from above and you were operating on me and this particular anecdote happened, you told this to the surgeon and so on. And in some cases that happens to be what was taking place. Now we should, that, that should be very, exciting as a potential route of inquiry because it's telling us potentially that when the heart is stopped, the lungs are stopped and the brain we don't know in some cases people can rush and have EEGs, electroencephalogram at the same time that the, per the person is clinically dead and if you see many factors here that the EEG is flat, that the person then can be brought back to life, remember something, tells it, and it has a veridical aspect to what was happening in the objective world. This is a huge crack in our understanding of what the brain is. Mm. So it's worth, it's worth taking it seriously and studying it, and people have done it. Do you differentiate out of the body experiences, which sometimes happens in surgery, uh, with near-death experiences? Yes, I think they're related, but they're different. I had a near-death experience, but I didn't have an out-of-body experience. Mm. I wasn't seeing myself outside of the body. Uh, but these experiences, this is another thing to say about them, and I've studied them a lot since I had my own, they're often presented as anecdotes. Oh, you see what the young or the old man or the old lady told about, like stories. But when you, when you have an anecdote after an anecdote. When you have a thousand anecdotes, this is, starts to sound like data, especially if you can study it well in, in, in you know, studies that are well designed and you start mm. to see patterns. This is how science works. And then you see patterns that are conserved in variant aspects of those experiences. Others, of course, are colored by your religious beliefs, you could say, or even scientific beliefs, right? So. These anecdotes are not just anecdotes. There's a lot of data so far, and now we can address it from the neural side of things, and we still don't know. But I think the relevant thing to say about this is what's a brain? If a brain is a productive organ of consciousness, or as William James put it more than 100 years ago, if it is a permissive <laughs> organ. And so out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, given the data that we start having, suggest it's more the latter, it's a permissive, it's a filter more than a productive um, organ of these, of these things we call mind and consciousness. The fact that we have similarities in all of these, these anecdotes which enable it to become data yeah. uh, is entirely predictable under a materialistic uh, point of view because it's the same brain generating that activity and that materialistic view is supported by uh, neural stimulation of those same areas uh, through uh, 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 magnetic trans uh, through the skull or, or in epilepsy patients when you can actually stimulate because you, you have to do that uh, to help the patient, um, that you create, you create the same sensation. So it's entirely um, 
logical that you should have similarities with all these experiences because the brain is doing the same thing. Sometimes you can replicate or create similar states. Sometimes you cannot. I think materialism is infinitely promissory and infinitely pr flexible in trying to explain. And in this particular case, near-death experiences, it's really important because if, there's, if something survives bodily consciousness, materialism doesn't survive. No, for, for and that's what they're fighting when I say they. I mean, they're really trying to stretch the, the, the explanation um, to make it fit within the frame. But let me just add, if the brain is a kind of computer and when we die, it's quasi broken or quasi turned off, mm -hmm. it starts to become a bit too much of a, of a leap of faith to think, oh, and in that case, it's when people have these incredible experiences that are consistent and also transformative of their life. So again, I would just say, please don't say that science knows there's nothing after our brain dies. You rather be humble and say, we don't know, and there's data that suggests that something could be going on, and let's go for it. So I, I'm uh, kind of caught between the two aspects. On the one hand, I, I, I am not a, 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 a strong materialist uh, at all. I, I, I think that is less likely than, not impossible, but less likely than non-materialistic theories. On the other hand, I don't think out of the body or near-death experiences, even with all the data, is, I, I wouldn't use that in support of what I believe. That, that, that makes me alien to both sides. All right, that's, I think that's an interesting place to be. So I, I congratulate you for that, <laughs> really. <laughs> and look, we need what we need. I don't know congratulations or condolences. No, no, sure. no, we, we need what we need in order to change our beliefs. In the East, all of those things are well known, like, you know, there's Tukdam in Buddhism and people are physically dead and still have very, very anomalous physical and you could even some mental processes going on. Now, in the West, because over the last 400 years, our civilization is hardcore scientific, we need those um, big problems to go through the funnel of science in order so that we can believe other things that, again, in other cultures, in other times were totally normal. And, and that's where we are. So it's good that people are skeptical because it's a big thing to let go of. Um, my only insistence is let's not tell ourselves or the people that we know there's nothing. Some famous notorious authors, neuroscientists speak and say, Shh, you know, science knows there's nothing after it. It's like, that's absolutely not the case. That's a false statement. We don't know. And if anything, there's some anomalies and we should pay attention to them. That's all I'm saying.